whether this is a good idea or not. But we read that he rose and went. There was no hesitation in Philip. When he got there, he saw a carriage on the road. Carriages would indicate wealth. Don't know if you thought about that. Philip sees the chariot and the spirit tells him to join it. Imagine that for a second. Philip doesn't know this man and this man doesn't know Philip. He's wealthy and Philip is ordinary. A carriage is not a synagogue or a place where someone would typically seek the truth, correct? Furthermore, Philip doesn't have a chariot to catch up with him, so he must what? Presumably run alongside. Can you just imagine that? <laughs> and speak loudly to get the man's attention. How many of us would be able to do that? Anyway, the man in the carriage is truly fascinating. It turns out that this man is heading back to Ethiopia. This man is a eunuch, and we read that he serves as the treasurer for Candace, the queen of Ethiopia. Well, what in the world is a eunuch from Ethiopia doing on this road, reading a scroll of Isaiah? Good question. The text tells us that he was traveling to Jerusalem to worship. Really? Eunuchs customarily couldn't go into the temple to worship. Eunuchs in this society were often slaves. They were castrated straight after they were imported into the empire. Within Ottoman society, these eunuchs were usually divided into two groups, black and white slaves. You could certainly consider them to be misfits, or outcasts. We can only assume that this one is a proselyte or maybe a Jew who was actually sold into slavery like Daniel or Joseph. We have no further information. It's a really strange story. But this man is a sincere seeker and God wants him saved. That's amazing. What are you reading? Philip approaches his carriage. I imagine that this would be a little bit intimidating. This is a strange man with a nice chariot. He's, he's from a region far away. Philip asks him, do you understand what you're reading? The man replies, how can I unless someone actually guides me? Then the man invites Philip to sit with him in the chariot discussing Isaiah 53. Could you please move the next slide? So in Acts 8.32, it says, now the passage of the scripture that he was actually, this was reading earlier, was like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied to him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. This ancient passage is actually a prophetic passage about Jesus and shows us clearly that, in, in fact, the entire Old Testament points to who? To Jesus. I actually couldn't help when I was preparing but to take the opportunity um, to emphasize the supernatural nature and accuracy of the Bible. And I'm using a quote by Hugh Ross, who wrote... Uh, the evidence for the reliability of the Bible. And look what he says. The Bible, unique among all books ever written, accurately foretells specific events in detail, many years, sometimes centuries, before they occur. 
Now look at this. Approximately 2,500 prophecies appear in the pages of the Bible. And about 2,000 of which already have been fulfilled to the letter. No errors. That is amazing. That should give us truly amazing ammunition. That is amazing. Two and a half thousand prophecies out of which 2,000 were already fulfilled. But it gets better. The scholars tell us that Jesus himself fulfilled at least 300 of these prophecies in his earthly ministry, which is actually humanly impossible. That's amazing. But back to our story. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom I ask does the prophet speak? About himself or somebody else? Well, for Philip, it was easy to connect this text to Jesus. He shows how this text refers to Jesus, the Messiah who was despised and rejected by Israel. The rest of this text tells them that this Messiah makes an offering for all the transgressors. Now, if the eunuch were to continue reading Isaiah 55, he would hear the most beautiful invitation from God to come into the kingdom and receive the blessings of God. But if he continued to read on in Isaiah 56, he would find another exceptional passage which many of you may not be as familiar with. And this, in fact, is the passage I took the title of my message from. So Isaiah 56. Look what God says about the foreigners and the outcasts. Let not the foreigner who was joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, Behold, I'm a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold my, fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it, and holds fast my covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Hallelujah. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. The Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel declares, I will gather yet others to him beside those already gathered. Wow. This truly is an amazing passage in and of itself. I think that could be preached on. There's just so much in it. The eunuch then looks out the window, <laughs> sees desert, and guess what he sees? He sees water. Wait a minute. What are the odds of that? How many times in the desert are you going to come upon water? But of course, God supernaturally makes a way. When this eunuch sees water, he asks, What prevents me from being baptized? So when Philip hears that the eunuch wants to obey, he commands the chariot to stop, and they get down into the water together so that Philip can baptize him, immersing him in the water. The Bible says that after this, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away to preach in other towns, and the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. The eunuch still had joy even though Philip left, because he didn't have his joy in the teacher. Of course not. His joy was in the gospel and in the Lord. Hallelujah. So what is the point of looking at this 
obvious conversion story and what can we learn from it. First, we must point out that many things about Philip and the eunuch are really unique. It is unique that this man is Ethiopian. We hear, we hear almost nothing about the church's growth in Egypt or Ethiopia throughout Acts. This is it. I imagine Luke didn't have much to say about that work because he probably wasn't part of it. Also, it is unique because in all of the conversion stories in the book of Acts, we rarely see a single person being converted because the Holy Spirit himself specifically told someone to go and talk to them. Wow. Double wow. The Bible only mentions such supernatural conversions three times. And there is this eunuch, Saul, who became Paul, and Cornelius. That is it. But outside of these specific instances, we seldom see the Holy Spirit telling one man to go to another and teach him the gospel. The eunuch has just been reading Isaiah after traveling to Jerusalem. We don't know anything else. We actually don't even know his name. I was pondering about that. Other than that, we only know that he's a treasurer for the queen of Ethiopia. He's definitely outside of the tribe of Israel. He's a foreigner, and in the eyes of people, definite outcast. So what is the takeout from this teaching, if there is any? I believe it's twofold, and that's what was welling up in my heart. Firstly, a loving, kind, and merciful God wants to minister to the foreigners, misfits, and outcasts. How many of you, perhaps even here, may have felt that way all your lives? Hmm? You don't quite fit. You don't belong. You look different. Perhaps you are of different cultural background or color, like me. I'm sure I've got some relatives down here. <laughs> Amen, I see northern heads. This is difficult. You may have been struggling emotionally and spiritually to get accepted, to be included, and to be understood. And you've been hiding it. And these wounds can be very, very, very deep and very often generational. They linger and we pass them on not knowing, and most of us have never dealt with it or received any healing in this area. Well, I am here to tell you that God sees and knows exactly who you are. He doesn't care about the social barriers that men create. He doesn't care about your status or the way you look on the outside. He only cares about your heart. The Lord will go literally out of his way to show love, acceptance, and minister to those who diligently seek him. Look what the Bible tells us about God's heart. People look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Second Chronicles, the Lord searches all the earth for people who have given themselves completely to him. He wants to make them strong. This story shows that God is in every detail. 
Through the powerful leading of the Holy Spirit, he shows the accuracy of the timing, the location, and the circumstances. I personally find it fascinating because this story is miraculous. So much so that God even uses an angel to appear to Philip. Well, God is in your life story too. He's in the timing. He's in the detail. And he's orchestrating all the circumstances pertaining to your life. He loves you and he's in control. He wants to heal and truly deliver you of all emotional, mental, and spiritual wounds or trauma. Jesus delivered us from it all. Amen? Isaiah 53, we're right in, in, in that book. He delivered us from it all. We don't have to keep walking around wounded and keep hiding. The second part of my conclusion is obviously evangelistic. We need to reach out to those who are simply not like us or who don't look like us. God calls for us to, to step out in faith and reach those who might be outcasts. The question is, will we do it? Are we willing to show even a mustard seed of faith? Are we offering God's invitation to those around us? Are we inclusive of those who are different from us? who look different, who speak or perhaps act strange. Throughout the book of Acts, we will see multiple events like this. God expects his evangelists to push through barriers and reach out to those who are not like them. This goes against the way of the world around us today. Hello? In today's society, in our workplaces, and unfortunately as well as in our churches, we tend to be very class-orientated, interest-orientated, selective, and very clicky. Mm -hmm. It's hard to hear. As we study this text, it is apparent that the eunuch was a sincere seeker. He was rich soil and ready to accept the truth. Who knows how often we are around really hurt people who do feel like foreigners and outcasts, but in fact they are sincere seekers and no one is reaching out to them. No one is showing kindness to them and sharing the truth with them. Remember Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Consider how many people complain about even having to say hello to a stranger, including church, or shake their hand, and God forbid, talking to them. Mm. I'm not a people's person. I'm shy. I'm not an extrovert. This is too hard for me. I'm not an evangelist or a leader. Why me? Why? Why? This is what we hear. This is what I hear a lot. Why me? I'm not this. I'm not that. But why not you? Why not? I wonder what God thinks about our insecure and self-defeating thoughts racing through our mind when he clearly says in his word that we can do all things through Christ, right? Who will strengthen us. We have been anointed and appointed to what? To build his kingdom. We have been equipped. We should be an ambassadors for Christ. He gave us the great commission. On and on it goes. So with these kinds of excuses, I don't think we're going to get the job done. <laughs> I would imagine that God sees us making excuses, and when he does, his heart is broken. Because Jesus didn't make a single excuse. 
He died for the whole world, but according to Luke, mainly for the deeply broken, misplaced, outcasts, and misfits. So in Luke he says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Now I imagine he's talking physical and spiritual sickness. Brothers and sisters, consider this. You sit here today as a result of the same story. Someone was moved enough to share the truth with you. Someone took the time. Someone took the risk and sacrificed for you. Someone, like Philip, came up alongside with you. Someone shared God's love with you. And someone pointed Jesus to you. Yes? Amen. And thank God they did. Amen. Thank God that you are here today in the house of the Lord, praising him. But please remember, all of those about acts of love were also acts of risk and obedience, which God himself used as doors to open just for you, to reach you, including the door of your heart to receive him and spend eternity with him. How incredible is that? How grateful and how amazed should we be? I would imagine that this morning right here, right now, as we're sitting here, all are saved. But if not, do not delay. Do not leave it for one moment longer. Get right with God and accept Jesus as your Savior while you may be reached. Look what Isaiah said. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Well, that means there may be time when it might be too late. There may, you may not be given the opportunity. I never thought about it. And I remember when I first read that scripture, it really struck me. I was saved, but it still struck me. Because we don't think about it. However, if there is anyone here today that's been really wounded, even after years perhaps of attending church, you have a spirit of rejection, maybe shame, abandonment, and pain in your soul, I would like to pray for you. We would love to pray for you this morning. Jesus came for those who are hurting and who feel sick. So if that is you, I would like to actually invite you this morning to come forward. Maybe we can pray for you. Maybe this could be a moment of deliverance for you. Maybe it is something that has never been addressed. Maybe it is something that you yourself have not even been aware of and been struggling in your heart. So if you would like a prayer, this is an invitation. Don't feel ashamed of, of being broken. Don't feel ashamed of feeling the pain and rejection. There's no shame in that. This is the house of God. We're here to minister. So if there's anyone at all, we will pray for you. It's time to deal with it. It's time to heal your heart.
Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for your word this morning. I want to thank you for having spoken to your people. In the name of Jesus, I take authority over the spirit of rejection, pain, and shame, and we bind it in the name of Jesus. We speak to every wounded heart, every broken heart, every hurting soul that was wounded by, by strife and conflict. We speak healing. And yes, we speak Jesus. We speak the name of Jesus over ourselves, over our families, over our circumstances. We speak deliverance this morning. There is deliverance in the house of the Lord. We speak deliverance and complete healing, complete restoration. We speak God's presence and His healing touch. We praise you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. You are the healer. You are a deliverer. You have died for us that we might be completely free, that we might have complete freedom. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you for ministering to us. We thank you for loving us so much. We thank you. We thank you.